this morning, our Father and our God, we come into your presence. We come into your presence fully aware that you are a sovereign God. You rule over everything. You control everything. We come into your presence realizing, dear God, that we're only here in our condition and situations of what they are and no worse, only because of your grace and because of your mercy. So we thank you, dear God. But we thank you also, dear God, for giving us understanding and giving us knowledge to know, dear God, that if it weren't for your goodness and your grace in our lives, that certainly our life would not be worth living. It would not be here. We'll be somewhere, perhaps in some lonesome graveyard. We'll be standing before the judgment with nobody to go our bond. But because of your love and because of the commitment of your son Jesus Christ and because of your spirit that lives in us, we are convinced, Heavenly Father, that it's better to live life with you than to try and live life without you. So we ask that whatever we do today would reflect hearts that have been committed and dedicated to your honor and your glory. Take us out of self. Control us by your spirit. Influence our heart. Cause us to look within and not without. To see ourselves and not our brother. Help us to make the necessary changes in our life that we need to make. Help us to realize that we can't make these changes by ourselves. But you said that we come to you and submit to you that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual and mighty. Only you can produce this, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. So move mightily. Bring conviction. Somebody here today is lost. Save them, dear God. Somebody is outside of the fellowship of the church. Restore them, dear God. Move mightily. Move mightily. Move mightily. So that we can see you and only you. We can hear you and only you. That's what we desire in this service. Let it be special to us today. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, family. As we stand all over the building, we may have it on the screen a little bit, but if you have your hymn book in front of you, we're on page 137. Anybody happy in Jesus this morning? Anybody happy in Jesus this morning? Amen. Well, my, the sun, well, my, 
in darkness and shed his glories in glory when Christ the mighty maker died Christ the mighty man from man the creature sin man the creature oh at the cross cross and where I first I first saw and the burdens of my heart rolled away oh it was there I think I received received my hand now oh I am happy all right we got one more verse y'all but drops of grief but drops can never repay the debt of love I owe love I hear Lord I give myself away Lord I give my tis all that I can do all that I can all right come on y'all let's blast it for Jesus oh at the cross where I first I first saw had the burdens of my heart rolled away oh it was there by faith I received received my and now now I am happy come on y'all know we gotta go back to the country oh at the cross oh where I first sounds good to me oh and the burdens of my heart rolled away oh it was there by faith I received received my and now now I am happy one more time like that oh at the cross We're singing for Jesus. Oh, at the cross, cross at where I first, I first saw, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. I'm so glad that it was there by faith. I received, received my sight. Praise in this building, you may be seen. saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rode away. And we're reminded this morning, if there had been no baby in the manger, there would be no man on the cross. Amen. Scripture reading this morning, uh, Spirit led me to read to you Luke Gospel chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, and it reads, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up into Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, 
because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Verse 7 says, She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in their field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. Verse 10 says, The angel said unto them, Fear not. But behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace goodwill toward men. The grass withered, the flower faded away, but the word of God is already blessed. Our deacons will come and offer prayer. Amen. Good morning. Let us go to the throne of grace. The most holy eternal God, our Father, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <coughs> Father God, we come here to say thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Holy Spirit, Spirit of the living God, yeah. fall fresh upon us. Yeah, yeah. Heavenly Father, I know you say I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord, where prayers can be heard and mercy can be found. Not my will, but let your will be done. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I know you say man ought to always pray and not faint. Heavenly Father, I know you say if my people, which are called by my name, if they humble themselves and pray, seek thy face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive them for their sin and heal their land. Heavenly Father, I know you say, well, two or three gathered together in our name. Thou will be in the midst and bless us. Send down a blessing. Holy Spirit, thank you for First Community Antioch. Thank you. Give us the love that runs from heart to heart. Bind us together that one can't fall for the other. Teach us to be obedient to your word. Give us the unity. Stop us from murmuring. Stop us from complaining. Not my will, but let your will be done. There be any stripes, any malices. Let everything be dead, decent, and hard. Father God, we just want to say thank you. Thank you right now. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the death, the burial, and the resurrection. This is the reason for the season. Father God, thank you for Pastor Gain. Give him the power to preach the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Heavenly Father, I know y'all say I give you pastor that will give you power and understanding. Not my will, but let your will be done. Give him the power to preach, Father, that somebody might come run. What must I do to be saved? Heavenly Father, not my will, but let your will be done. Thank you for his wife. Thank you for Sister Gain. Thank you for her quiet spirit. Thank you for the women ministry. Thank you for every ministry here at First Community Antioch. Father God, not my will, but let your will be done. Father God, we just want to trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lead not to thy understanding, but in all thy way acknowledge him, and he shall direct our paths. Father God, when we can't talk to you no more, we can't pray to you no more, let the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. The Lord, my strength, my redeemer. All these blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and thank you.
theme for the year. Our theme for the year is Our Old Testament support the scripture is it says Our New Testament support the scripture is it says Also, James 4 and 7 says, This is the day that the Lord has made, and we should rejoice and be glad in it. So glad. Until at this time, we want to warmly greet somebody. Amen. Our motto for the year is go forward. We want to go forward in Christ likeness. We want to be like Christ. We want to be forward, go forward in giving a living testimony by not only our words, but by our deeds of the holiness and the righteousness of our Lord and Savior Christ in obedience to Almighty God and a willingness to allow God to use our life in a way that he so desires, and not according to our specification, but according to what he has designed. And it's a good design because the Bible says, God says, I know my plan for you, and they are good. Cooperate with God, yield to him, and let God fulfill his plans in your life. Amen? Nobody, nothing, a devil can't stop God from fulfilling his, fulfilling his plan if you give yourself to God. Amen? At this time, let us come to the altar. This is an opportunity to confess our sin, an opportunity to thank our God for his goodness and to remember uh, just how far the Lord has brought us. Isn't it wonderful? If it had not been for the Lord on our side, the Lord says, fear is not in me. I'm not here to fight with you. He said, take hold of my strength. Fear is not in me. I can cut you down if I want to cut you down. I can change the condition of your life if I wanted to. I can really make it hard for you if I wanted to. I can cut off some of your blessings. I can really deal with you, stop dealing with you on the basis of mercy and grace, and start dealing with you on the basis of justice. 
I can give you what you really deserve. But because I'm a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of patience, I choose to deal with you on the basis of mercy. Let us thank him for that. Thank him for provision. Thank him for spiritual provision. He has given us his Bible. He has given us access to the throne where we can pray. He has given us mercy and grace and patience, long-suffering. Let us thank him for his spiritual blessing. Let, him, let us thank him for his physical blessing. Oh, we got eyeglasses, we got hearing aids, we got all this stuff. But I tell you what, we still have a certain portion of health and strength. We still can get around. We might need a can, we might need crutches, we might need medicine to get us through the day. But nonetheless, we're not in somebody's mall. We're not, we're not in intensive care. We got much to thank God for his physical blessing. Let us thank him for his financial blessing. The nice garments that we have on right now, they weren't given to us. Somehow, in some way, God blessed us with jobs and blessed us with income and blessed us with friends. Somebody gave us something. We were able to go to the mall. We were able to go to the store and purchase some stuff and come to the church of God looking good. All because God has blessed us not only spiritually, physically, but he blessed us financially. And so we can thank him for that. And we can thank him for our husband and our wife. We can thank him for our sons and our daughters, our, our sons-in-law and daughter-in-law. We can thank him for the friends that we have, those people that we can count on to give us an encouraging word. Somebody is willing to lend us that shoulder so we can lean on because sometimes oh, we are not as strong as we like to be. Lean on me. Somebody told us, lean on me when you're not strong. I help you carry on. This week. So we thank God for one another. We thank him for the church. We thank him for our pastor. We thank him for our members. We just thank God. So Father, we thank you today. We acknowledge that we're only here, and we're enjoying a certain quality of life, only because you've been good to us, only because you've been merciful, and only because you have determined to deal with us, not according to our behavior, and give us what we deserve. you determined to deal with us according to your very nature, which is love, forgiveness, which is compassion, goodness. You're good to us. In spite of us, you're good to us. We haven't always done it the way you wanted us to. We thank you. We ask that you would keep us in your keeping care. And we ask that you would continue to move us from one degree of grace to another. Bless us with grace to move forward and develop in our Christian lives. To give increase to our spirituality. Give increase to our fellowship. Thank you. That's what we want to say, thank you. Thank you. Help us to include you in all of our decisions. But rather help us, dear God, to seek your guidance in making decisions. Help us to get beyond and above those things that represent weight and sins that so easily beset us. Help us to run this race with patience. Help us to realize that soon and very soon, we're going to meet the king. And when we stand before you, we want to hear you say, well done. So we thank you. I thank you for these your people. Every last one of them, I thank you for them. And I pray you bless them according to their needs. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. And the Lord keep you. God bless you, Cheryl. God bless you. Amen.
have you prepare our hearts of our tithe and offerings. I ask that you repeat after me. We give thee by thy own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone. A trust, O Lord, from thee. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, thank you so much for this wonderful blessing and marvelous opportunity that you've given us. We thank you for the grace and the mercy that you've shown us, your loving kindness, and most of all, Father, for giving us of our evil and sinful way. Now we come before you, Father, with our tithes and offerings, realizing that, God, if it had not been for you, we wouldn't be able to stand or be able to be here. But thank you, dear God, for this marvelous day. In Jesus' name, amen. I thought you would remember.
that's working now for me. Oh, his blood redeems me from the stains of sin. And his blood cleanses me deep down within. So if you ask me how I made it and how I've overcome, I can tell you it's because of the blood. And I'm here to testify God is not dead He's still alive The same blood that was shed Way back at Calvary Is the same blood That's working now for me Oh, His blood redeems me From the stains of sin and his blood cleanses me deep down within. So if you ask me how I made it and how I overcome, I can tell you it's because of the blood.
22nd through the 27th verses. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, beginning with verse number 22. Shall we stand for the reading of the word? Let's begin reading together. And straightway Jesus constrained disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was undrained. And in the full watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightly Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And amen. God bless you for your obedience. You may be seated. I want to speak to us tonight, today, from a message entitled, When You Find Yourself in a storm. Whenever you find yourself in a storm. Now, according to John chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, after the crowd saw and experienced the miracle of Jesus, that Jesus fed approximately 10,000 people with two fishes and five loaves of bread. They were about to try, the people that was, was about to try and force Jesus to become king. And Jesus would not be forced or coerced into acting 
outside, understand me well, of God's will for his life. Jesus knew that the people being excited uh, about the miracle that he had performed was about to, if he would have allowed them to take him and force him to be king. Again, Jesus would not act outside of God's will for his life. And therefore, he constrained, forced, persuaded the disciples to get into a ship and to go to the other lake side of Lake Genesaret. By doing this, Jesus would be removing his disciples away from that crowd whose motive and intent was contrary to the purpose of God. Yeah, right. It's a crowd that we hear that motive and that purpose is contrary to the intent of God. And so then therefore, I need to get my disciples out of that environment uh -huh, uh -huh. because they're not strong enough now to handle that type of temptation. And we got to understand that when we are engaging in certain kinds of behavior, certain kind of talk, we got to be aware that there may be babes around us, Christians, young Christians, uh, uh, even those who are contemplating giving their life to Christ. We, we got to be careful as to how we conduct ourselves in times of the words we speak and the action we take. Because there are weaker brothers and sisters who are, are just beginning this Christian life. And to see us who are supposed to be seasoned and with a certain level of maturity act the way we act, it discourages them and they fail to see the dynamics that are involved in serving God. Now be careful how you act. You've been in the call supposedly for 20 years, for 25, 30, 40 years. And if you handle situations in an undignified Christian manner, if you've been in Christ all that time, and you can't get over your fits. If you've been in Christ all of that time and you, you can't uh, deal with your brother or your sister in a better manner than what you feel, we, what about that 16-year-old uh, Christian? What about that 21-year-old Christian? And, and so then we're supposed to be, somebody said this morning, the light of the world. And when folks look at us, and especially young believers, they are to learn lesson from us, a learn lesson pertaining to human relationship, how to handle different situations, how to conduct ourselves in the midst of the storm that come into our lives. And so then he knew that the crowd was not spiritual. And he knew that their aim were outside of the will of God. And so that's why I need to get my little church, my young church, out of, again, that atmosphere, out of that environment. And so then, my question to you is, have you checked your motive lately? Can you say that what I am doing is truly and only for the glory of God and for the advancement of his kingdom? It makes no difference whether you pastoring, whether you uh, uh, teaching, it makes no difference. The question is, can you see that your motive is pure and true? And I'm doing it not for a paycheck. I'm doing it not for the glory of man. But I'm doing it for the glory of God. See, when you're doing it for the glory of God, you're able to look beyond uh, the obstacles and look beyond the weapon that Satan fires at you and look beyond uh, the trap that he tried to set for you, to look beyond the innuendos and the suggestions that he might make to your mind. You look beyond that because I'm 
I'm doing this for the glory of God. And I don't expect it to be easy all the time because after all, he did tell me when he put me on this journey, when he involved me in this ministry or whatever it is, he told me that the servant is no greater than the master. If they did it to me, they're going to do it to you. He told me if I had trials and tribulations, you're going to have trials and tribulations as well. And so then when well, Satan comes against you and when storms sometimes rise in your life, you're not looking to blame others. You are asking yourself, what purpose does God have in allowing this situation to exist in my life? Somebody need to hear that today because this, this situation that you're in can tear you down. The situation that you're in has upset you much. And you need to understand that God is still in control. Nothing would be taking place in your life, whether it's good or bad, except God has permitted it or caused it to be so. You need to cheer up. You need to cheer up. That way you can stop, you can, you can stop blaming one another in the home. You can, you can stop blaming your boss on the job. You can stop blaming your co-workers because God knows exactly, and I'll show you that later, God knows exactly what you need. And he knows what I need. And God is still working all things out for the good of those who love him. God can take your lemon, and he can make lemonade. God can, God, God can take the hurt and the pain that you experience in your life and turn it into a learning experience, make you strong so that you can have a vital testimony, a vital testimony as to what God can do. You can tell others who are struggling, I've been there. Matter of fact, I was lower than what you are. I was deeper than where you are. But the Lord brought me out. I'm not telling you what David said. I'm not telling you what Michael said. I'm telling you what I experienced for myself. I call upon the name of the Lord. You can tell him that. I call upon the name and God made a way for me out of nowhere. God brought me out. He's brought me up. He set my foot upon a rock. And so then Jesus said the young church is not able to bear this temptation too great. A temptation, Dr. Joe Gregory wrote a book, uh, Too Great a Temptation, reflecting on his struggles at uh, First Baptist Church of Dallas. And uh, took uh, Pastor Chris Well died. And he talked about too great a temptation. And Jesus knew that this was too great a temptation for his disciples to be in. And so therefore, he would say, go on the other side. You're not able to handle this yet. You're not able to handle what is taking place on this side. So you got to go on this side. Somebody ought to help me out in this place. You need to know that the side that you're on right now may not be the final destiny that God has for you, but this might be the side of preparation. God might have you on this side because he's preparing you. And once he gets you prepared, once he enlightens your mind, once he gets you to understand that what you can't get along without him, once you learn the lesson that is on this side, then he'll bring you back to this side. And the thing that you can't handle now because you're too weak, you'll be able to handle them later because you've learned some lessons on this. I hope I'm not confusing you. You've learned some lessons on this side. And so if you're down, it's, it might be the side, the side of preparation. If, if you're being ridiculed and gone, it's not appreciated, it might be the side of preparation. God want to make you strong over here. But if you leave your stay here, this situation over here is too much for and it just might destroy that make sense? It just might destroy you. But it will bring you over here and it will fix you up. I'm going to put on you the breastplate of righteousness. I'm going to put the shield of faith in your hand and put your, your feet to shot with the gospel of the preparation of peace. And now when I send you back to this side, you'll be able to have glory, hallelujah. That's what he has. Have you checked your motive lately? While on the sea, a stone arose. And, and let me tell you this, but, but Reverend, 
They, 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 they were with Jesus. Yeah, but Storm arose. Reverend, they had seen his miracles. Storm arose. I'm trying to get you to see that no matter what you know, no matter who you are, no matter what you have, no matter what your friends say about you, you need to know that storm will rise. Everybody don't think that you're the best singer in the world. Everybody, everybody don't think that you're the best preacher in the world. Everybody won't think that you're the best teacher in the world. Everybody won't think that we're about you, whether it's true or not. Everybody won't think. Everybody won't jump on the bandwagon with you. I'm, I'm helping somebody. I know I'm helping somebody. Right. So you get all upset when those people on your job or with, uh, your circle of friends, you find out that one of them is acting up. And you get all upset. But you need to understand, my brother and my sister, Jesus did not have 100%. Right. What makes you think you're going to have 100%? It's storm going to come in your life. Storm will come no matter your economic condition, no matter your financial status. Storm will come no matter your ed educational accomplishment. Storm will come. You're going to find that you, sometimes you're the only one that's shouting over your bachelor's degree. You're the only one that's waving your master's degree. You're the only one that, 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 that promoting your doctor's degree. You're going to find out a whole lot of folks don't care about that. They just don't like you, and they won't like you, and they won't go along with you. Storm will come in your life. You've got to understand that. You need to make sure when storm comes that your faith is anchored in Jesus. Because storms are bound to come. At some time or another in your life, storm will come in your life. You say that sometime of that future, but presently I'm already in a storm. That's why I came to tell you how to handle yourself when you find yourself in a storm. You got to make sure, first of all, that you are anchored in Christ. You got to make sure that what you're doing. You're doing it because of a conviction deep down within that God has equipped you and assigned this particular task or this particular ministry or this particular situation to your hand. Your own assignment. Am I helping somebody? But you need to understand also that you need help when you're in a storm. You can't handle a storm by yourself. And the Bible says that in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came walking on the water. Now, you've got to understand, in Jewish time, the night was divided into four watches, first, second, third, and fourth watch. He could have come in the first watch of the night. He could have come in the second watch or the third watch. But he waited until the fourth watch, believing to believe, thinking that he waited to the fourth watch because he had them to do all that they could. The Sea of Galilee, at its widest point, is about six miles. And the Bible said it was in the midst of the sea, which means if the Sea of Galilee, the widest point is six miles, it means that they had been rowing for nine hours and had only accomplished three hours. But he had to wait until he had exhausted all of their props. He had to wait until they had finally come to realize, you know what? We just can't handle this. And as long as you think you can handle life by yourself, on your own, with your lunch, according to the school you went to, if you think that's all you need to handle life, you're in for a disappointment. Because sooner or later, Life going to present you with something that the subject matter did not cover in your English class, in your biology class, in your chemistry class. Life got a way of throwing stuff at us that is not uh, included in the 
uh, institutional curriculum. That, that life, life will throw some stuff at you that you need power and help from beyond the human level. That's where God comes in. And Christ said, now they, they got it now. They can't handle it. And so you can't walk in, oh, on the water in the forward watch of the night. Now why? He can't walk in on the water. What would give him trouble? Wind and the wave, waves would give him the trouble. And Christ came walking on top of that, which was causing him trouble. He's always above your trouble. Whatever is causing you trouble, he's above that. Whatever is causing you heartache, he is above that. Whatever is causing you unrest in your life, he is above that. Whatever is causing you worry, he is above that. And so then, it doesn't matter when he comes. What matters is that he comes. He, he came, he came, he will come. And whenever he comes, he comes to bless you. Whenever he comes, he comes to help you. Whenever he comes, he comes to put your soul at ease. It may not look like it. I call upon you to ease my burden. Seems like you're putting more burden on me. It just might seem that way. But know this, whenever he comes, he comes to take charge and to take control and to bring you to that destiny that God has for you. He came, and not only did he come walking on the water, you saw the scripture that said that they were uh, afraid because they thought he was a spirit. But he wouldn't let them remain in that particular mindset, that conception, because he wanted them to give him the credit for what he was about to do. And a lot of times we give our job the credit. We give this the credit and that the credit. But God wants us to give him credit. He wants us to give him credit for our being here today. He wants to give us give him credit for our having eyesight and I was able to articulate speech. He wants us to give him credit for bringing us safely from yesterday to this day. He wants to give us to give him credit for the job that we have, the money that we make, the food that we eat, the clothes that we wear, the house that we live in, the car that we run. God wants you to give him credit for the talent that you have, the ability that you have. He wants you to give him credit for the time that you spent with your loved ones and your friends. He wants you to give him credit for blessing your children if they finish school and went further, whatever it is, God wants you to give him the credit. I disciplined them. I told them this. I made sure they wouldn't do this. And I bought them this. And that's okay. But God said in the final analysis, whatever you did, you were able to do it because I blessed you and put you in that position. You would have had no money to give them had I not given you a job. You wouldn't have had no lesson to teach them had I not given you a mind and an understanding and put you on an instructor and give you give your mother and a father to teach you the way of life. That's why you were able to communicate to the other. They might help in somebody. Yeah, so he came and, and he, he came and he identified himself to his disciples. <laughs> he said, be not afraid, ego I mean, it is I. Yeah, it, it, it is I. And, and Peter, he didn't read that, that, that section, but he just said it. Peter says, well, since it is you, please enable me to do the same thing you're doing. You walking on, y'all miss that? Okay, I'll make it clear to you. Peter said, I see what you're doing. You're walking on the water. Now please permit me to do the same thing that you do. Please permit me. You, do, you, get the, you get the point I'm trying to make? I'm trying to make this at, at this point. If you want to do what Jesus is doing and you ask him, he'll give you the grace to do what he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus granted Peter his request. And so then, if you want to obey the Father like Jesus obeyed the Father, just ask him. 
he give you grace to obey. And, and, and if you want to love unconditionally, if you want to get beyond the tit for tat thing, and, and ask him, give me that love. Enable me to love like you love. You love the good, you do love the bad. You, you love those who supported you, you love those who didn't support you. You love those who, who talk good about you, you love those who talk bad about you. If you want to love everybody, you carry out the Great Commission, all you got to do is ask him. Peter, you want to walk on water? Come on. You want to love like I love? Come on. You want to forgive like I forgive? Come on. You want to show compassion like I show compassion? Come on. You want to help others like I help you? Come on. I enable you to do what I'm doing. And sure enough, when you give Peter the permission, Peter got out of the boat. And Peter began to walk on the wall. But something happened. Peter allowed himself to become sidetracked. He lost his focus. He lost his initial fear. His initial faith began to go down. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. Maybe that was a time when you lived at a high level of faith in God. Maybe that was a time when you just woke up and just lean and depend on it. I don't know what's going to go happen to me through, uh, throughout this day. But Father, I'm asking you to guide me and direct me. And whatever comes my way, give me the grace to represent you in an honorable way. Maybe you live at somebody over there laughing. Maybe you lived at a high level of faith at some time or another. Maybe it didn't matter to you. What folks thought about you, what they said about you, your aim and only aim in life was to please God and to satisfy him. That was a time when you cast not some, but all of your cares on God. You knew that God would provide. You took Paul seriously when he said, my God shall supply all of your needs. You believe that. You believe what Jesus said when he said, if you're not, the door is going to be open. If you ask, I'm going to give you. If you seek, you're going to find. You won't believe that. You believe that all things were going. You didn't complain. You didn't find fault. But you praise God in all circumstances of your life because you believe that all things were working together for good to those who love God. You believe that you were more than a conqueror and it didn't matter what life threw at you because you knew that God had given you the victory. You decide, I'm not going to pout, but I'm going to shout. Come what may, whatever comes my way, I'm going to shout. I'm going to pray my way through because I know that this will not last always. That was the time you live at a high level of faith. But maybe at this time, like Peter, your faith began to win. Somewhere along the way, you began to doubt. You begin to look around, and it seems as if God was remembering and had remembered everybody else but you. Your faith began to wane. It is here at this point that you need to imitate Peter. When Peter's faith began to wane, and Peter began to say, it was at this point that Peter offered a prayer. It wasn't a long prayer like some of y'all made. But it was a short prayer. Lord, save me. You need to do that. You need to remember that. Your faith has begun to wane and begin to sink. You need to remember what Peter did. Cry out to God. Lord, save me. Now, Peter could say, Lord, save me. And the Bible says that Jesus stretched forth his hand and he took Peter by the hand, which means that Jesus was near Peter. You need to know that he's near you. He is near me. That's the point I'm trying to make. He was, he was able to stretch forth his hand and take Peter's hand. He is near you. He's just arm length away from you. 
You call upon him. I don't care what storm have come into your life, and I don't care how you may be sinking in that storm. If you cry out to him, he is near you. He will come and rescue. Jesus is still near. You may not, at this point, feel his presence, but he is near. The Bible says he is near those of a broken heart. And when you're caught in a storm, you don't have to be overtaken by that storm. You need to recognize that Jesus is near. But I want to share with you several assurances that you can have, and then I'll close this message. Uh, when you're in a storm, first of all, you need to say to yourself, he brought me here. The disciples were in the storm because Jesus told them to go to the other side. And, and you get to remember that what is taking place in your life and where you are is not by accident, not by incident. God have ordered the circumstances of your life. And so then he brought you there. And listen, the disciples were in God's will because they obeyed what he said, go to the other side, so I'm going to the other side. And if you're in the storm because you obey God, then you can rest with great assurance that God is here with me. And let me say this to you. It's better to be, you got to get this, it's better to be in a storm with Jesus than to be on land with the cross. You may feel that it's safer on land with the crowd, but it's safer in the storm with Jesus. There are two kinds of stones. You want to remember that. Two kinds of stones. First of all, there are correction stones where God disciplines us for our disobedience. So God may allow a stone to be in your life because he, his aim is to discipline you to correct you for some dis disobedience. That's happened to Jonah. Jonah got caught in the storm. Now the disciples caught in the storm because they obeyed Christ. Jonah was caught in the storm because he disobeyed God. But he might send a correction stone. But then secondly, he may allow what we call a perfection stone, where God help us to grow because of our obedience. You see, if you are obedient to God, far from guaranteeing that everything's going to go easy, it just might grow hard because he wants to perfect you. He wants to promote you. When you pass the test that is given you in fifth grade, they move you on to sixth grade. <laughs> and so then when you pass the minor test, God will allow another test, a major test, because he want to promote you from one degree of living to another. Somebody else is shouting in this place. If you're not given a test, you remain in the same grade. And God is saying, you have mastered this, you have conquered this, you have learned the lesson that this storm here wanted you to learn. Now I'm going to increase the storm because I want to increase your development. I want to increase your learning. I want to increase your knowledge. I want to increase your strength. And so then, storms are hard. That's why you say sometimes, you know what, Ralph? It seems to me, when I was out there in the world, when I was playing church, it looked like everything was going good. But when I decided that I was going to give my life to Christ, and I was going to be obedient, and I was not going to play church anymore, I was going to be serious about it, looked like all hell broke out. Suddenly all hell broke out because God said, you have mastered this. I want to promote you to something bigger. And something greater. Yes, yeah, something happened to somebody in this place. Now I want you to take a couple of lessons, other lessons I want you to see. Now notice, Jesus had tested them in a storm before. If you read Matthew 8, 23 through 27, you find that what? Jesus was in the boat, in the hinder part of the ship, sleeping. And a stone came up. Now he had tested them. Had to get it. He had tested them before in a storm. But at that time, the first test that they had, 
Jesus was in the boat with them. Somebody get it. He was in the boat with them, so I'm going to give them a, a stone test. But I'm going to be in the boat with them. And so then all they had to do was go and wake him up. We're in the storm. Jesus stands up and says, peace be still. But not so they have learned that. But I want you to notice the progression here. When he calmed the storm in that first ship, the first storm, when he calmed that storm and he woke him up and he calmed the sea, what did the disciples say? Their response was, what manner of a man is this? who even the wind and the waves obey. Y'all got it? You got to get it. Listen, listen, that first, first storm in that, when Jesus was, was in the ship and he calmed the storm, the impact that it had on them was that it led them to say what manner of a M-A-N, man, is this, who even the wind and the waves obey. But now he will give him a second stone. And this time he will not be in the ship. He is outside of the ship. Oh, it's easy to trust him when you see him. It's easy to trust him when things are going. Yes. But now I'm going to intensify this. I'm going to give him another stone. But this stone here, I'm not going to be in the ship. I'm going to be on the outside of the ship. I'm going to be on the mountain praying where they can't see me. I'm going to try and increase their faith. Now, in the first storm, when they, he woke, they woke him up, they said, what manner of a M -A -N, man is this? But when he got in the ship and come the second storm, do you know what they said? Thou art the son of God. Amen. You see the progression? You see the growth? What manner they move from what manner of man is this? Now we are convinced, thou art the son of God. And every storm ought to increase your knowledge of God. It ought to increase your trust and your confidence in God. Every storm is designed to bring you to a point where you know and learn more of God after the storm than you did before the storm. And so when a, in the storm you're resting knowing that Jesus also is praying for you. Romans 8 and 34 says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God who make intercession for us? That scripture is saying when you are in the storm, you need to remember that Jesus is praying for you. He is praying for you. You're not there by yourself. You're not going through it. And, and, and the outcome of what happened is not determined and dependent upon your strength, your ability. Jesus is praying for you. Can you imagine that? He died for you. He was buried for you. He rose for you. He ascended to heaven for you. He's on the right hand of the Father. He's praying for you. How can you lose? With God above you, the spirit within you, and Christ on the side of you. Interceding on your behalf. Yes, Father, they miss the mark sometimes, but I died for them. Yes, Father, they don't always get it right, but I'm there as their representative. I'm there as their advocate. He's praying for you, know that. And whatever you're in right now, Jesus is praying for you. He is on your side. Another thing you need to say to yourself, he will come to help you. Often we feel that Jesus has deserted us when we are going through the hard times of life. When you find yourself weakening down because of the storms in your life. Remember, Isaiah said, when thou passest through the water, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Peter is to be commended. I know we laugh at Peter got out the boat. He began to sink. Peter began to fail. 
But first of all, before we condemn Peter, we ought to commend him. At least he got out of the boat. Anybody can sit in the boat and watch. Anybody can sit in the boat and criticize. Anybody can sit in the boat and point fingers. Everybody can sit in the boat and let others do the work. But at least Peter got out of the boat. His faith fell, yes, but he got out of the boat. He became afraid, yes, he got out of the boat. He didn't make it all the way through, but he got out of the boat. He had courage to get out of the boat. You ought to have courage. Get out of the boat of despair. Get out of the boat of hatred. Get out of the boat of unconcern. Get out of the boat of complacency. Get out of the boat. You might begin to sink, but always remember Jesus is right there. And all you got to do is call on him. He'll reach out his hand and pick you up. He won't let you drown. He won't let you fail. At least you have the courage to get out of the boat. To get out of the boat. To leave your comfort zone. The last thing I want to mention to you is that Peter got out of the boat. And the other disciples stayed in the boat. But because Peter got out of the boat, the other disciples were able to see the power of Jesus. They were comfortable sitting in the boat. I ain't getting out of that boat. I'm not going through that. I might get see what John, John probably said to Bartholomew, see what happened to him, man. Oh, he won't get out of the boat. Look, they sank it. But, but Peter getting out of the boat, putting himself in that sinking position, allowed the other disciples who were afraid to get out of the boat to see the power of Jesus. You might be beaten up on, and they might be whipped, black might be whipping upon you, and friends and so forth might be giving you a hard time. But remember this, remember this, the bruises, the puke, and the scum that you did is going to help somebody else. When Paul was in prison, the Philippian letter, he said, brothers who were afraid to preach the gospel, when they looked at me and saw that I was being punished and placed in prison for preaching the gospel, he said, they waxed stronger. And they began to preach with boldness. And if that young man who got killed on the week before last, and if many of your sisters and brothers are dying on a mission field right now, that will give you courage to serve God in peaceful time and in a peaceful country. You ought to get up off it and serve God. There are those who are giving their life to God. And they're not in air conditioned business. They're not sitting on plush coffee. I'm walking on plush coffee and sitting on comfortable pew. They are in the jungles. They are hiding. They have to sneak and, and, and meet. And if they can go through trials and tribulation and hardship, for the gospel of Christ, what make you and what make me? Can't be the little price that God has come to. You see, if you obey God, not only will he bless you, but he will make you a blessing to others. That's my message to you today. Amen. I may be one today, your presence. God is calling. God is calling for those who are willing to get out of the boat. If you're willing to get out of the boat, He is able to give you grace. Get out of the boat. The boat may be inside this place. Now, those who want to do all that serving inside the house. God is saying, I need you to get out of the boat, first community, and in your building. Get out of the boat. And trust me, I'm with you. I'm close to you. Don't worry about sinking. 
All power is in my hand. Get out of the boat. That boat might be your, that particular pew that you love to sit on. Maybe you're sitting on that pew, and you ought to be sitting on a pew up here. Maybe you're sitting on that pew, and ought to be the pew where those who work and serve in children's church are performing a great work for the Lord. That might be, get out of the pew. Go be a part of the children's church. Get out of the pew. Go be a part of youth Bible class. Go out of the pew. Be a part of women ministry. Get out of the pew. Start men ministry. Get out of the pew. Go to the nursing home and share the gospel. Get out of the pew. Get out of the boat. And go to the prison. Get out of the pew. Get out of the boat. Make it sense? Get out of the boat. Join some ministry. Get out of the boat. Show up. Perform a greater service and a greater task. If you are present and God has spoken to your heart, you can come down in one of these hours and acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And you hear him calling you. Get out of the pew. Get out of the boat. And use your talent. For the upbuilding of my kingdom. Get out of the boat. Get out of the pew. Use your skill. Use your knowledge. To facilitate. One of the group. On Sunday morning. That's a whole lot you can do. You see, we have limited ourselves to what we want to do. We want that glorious position. God says, I have called you to occupy the glory position, the spotlight. I have called you to be faithful for where I please you. If you're a doorkeeper, be faithful. If you can only give a cup of water, be faithful. Be faithful on Sunday morning. Be faithful to the inspiration of hour. Be faithful to the leadership hour. Be faithful to Bible class. Be faithful. That's all that you can do. We have limited ourselves to desiring to function in a certain place, in a certain area. We don't want to do the small things. We want to do that which we can see to be big. Am I helping somebody? You can't encourage other people to do what you're not doing. You disqualify yourself. You invalidate yourself. When you fail to follow Jesus, like he told you to follow. And when you fail to be faithful, you discredit yourself. I cannot preach to you what I preach if I didn't do it myself. I'm calling you to faithfulness. God bless you. You may be seated. Over right, hallelujah. love you so very kindly and want you to understand. I'm not at my age, not my experience. I'm not trying to preach good, really. I'm trying to be a good preacher. I can only be a good preacher if I preach to you what the Bible says. God said, you tell the truth and call my people. And God is calling us to a higher level of commitment, a higher level of service. Not because we've done anything wrong but because we have done so much right. 
And he said, now it's time for promotion. And the devil will try to play with your mind. Don't let God will for your life go undone because of fear or whatever. God is calling us to be faithful. And I don't, I don't apologize for taking the time. Read your Bible every day. Pray, Holy Spirit, help me to understand what I read. And before you pray, pray, Holy Spirit, lead me in prayer so my prayer can be in the will of God. Pray to the Spirit first to help you to pray so that you might pray according to what God intends for you. Am I helping somebody? Search all of your activities. Consider your thoughts. And in any way, if you're convicted at your activities and your thoughts, conflict and is contrary to the spirit of Christ, to the spirit of holiness and righteousness, and does not reflect God like it should, then ask God to give you grace to help you to abandon that which is of the flesh so you can live according to the spirit. Am I helping you? That's the kind of pastor I am. And if that's not right and it doesn't resonate with you, form a committee. And come to me. Say, well, we have decided to act that you vacate the pulpit until we find somebody else. And as long as I'm with you, I'm going to love you and I'm going to tell you the truth. And I'm going to encourage you to be faithful to God. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And we're not afraid of the stone. We're not running away from the stone. But we are leaning and depending on you in our stone. We are casting all of our cares upon you in our stone. For we know, dear God, that you have already given us the victory. Thank you for what you're doing in this fellowship. Thank you for the courage that you have given us to stand for you, to speak boldly, to believe, to trust, and to regard your opinion and your knowledge about us more than the opinion of man. We thank you, dear God. We trust you. And we know that we're in a storm now. But it's a, it's, it is a promotional storm where you seek to move us higher, higher, and higher. May we cooperate with you. May it be found in us a willing spirit, a cooperative spirit, to allow you to have your way. Bless these, your people. May they come together today as we eat together. May we be reminded, dear God, of the great sacrifice of our Lord who gives his life that we might commune together and partake of the sacrament. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory, hallelujah.